slaves. We started early in practice, so you guys are going to have to catch up.
one beside you. There's no one below you that compares to who you are. Awesome God, mighty God, creator God.
come against the enemy uh, and make him pay. Amen. For what he does to the children of God. Uh, there's times when there's deliverance uh, and there's victory uh, yeah. and there's overcoming uh, and there's freedom.
God. Well, I don't know what to say. God is awesome. And all he is and all he does. That's the place to say in my message I want to be able to share with you today. So I think I should probably move on a little bit. I want to give the opportunity to worship and giving this morning. And as Bob's coming, I want to share the announcements with you that are on the screen. This is something new. It's not new as far as something that's an annual thing. Every year at camp meeting, there is a state world missions project offering. So in other words, it's a, it's a world missions project that the state of Indiana has adopted and would like churches to participate in. So next Sunday, if you would like to contribute to a special offering, there'll be a video next week. It is in the country of uh, Sri Lanka. Devastated several years ago, if you remember, by a tsunami. But there's a project there, it is called the Safe Haven Widows Home. And other states are contributing to the cause. They needed $50,000 to do some renovations and so forth that would really help. They're almost there, and so they're hoping that. What we were able to give a camp meeting, we'll put them over the top for that. So keep that in mind for next Sunday, if you would. And then, once again, August 18th through 20th, coming up real fast, 6 p.m. nightly, Central Time, Indiana Camp Meeting Services. And then Sunday, October 10th, as you are aware, and I'm sure you've already marked it on your calendar, right? I'm sure you have. Yeah. Church Hot Dog Roast at Oak Ridge Perry Park, shelter number two. I will say that those who participated had a chance to come to the fellowship breakfast yesterday. We had a marvelous time. If you weren't there, you just missed out. Maybe next time, right? Next month, I'll give you a date soon on that and location, etc. So let's worship and giving today. You ask God to bless us together. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to be in your house again today. We ask that you would touch this offer you're about to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Joshua chapter 10, beginning verse 7. So this is a very interesting story. Let me add to that. It's not a fable. It is true. That there was a day 
that lasted for two days. So the sun stood still is the title of my message. So I hope I have your attention. The sun stood still. No, no, that's pretty impressive, right? Not for me, but I mean that's a pretty impressive statement from the Word of God. I would never claim to be impressive. All right. Joshua chapter 10, verse 7 is our beginning verse. If you'd like to stand for a moment. If you're not able to do that, that's fine. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. So the Lord routed them before Israel, killed them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, chased them along the road that goes to Beth Horon, and struck them down as far as Ezekiah and Makeda. And it happened as they fled before Israel and were on the descent of Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiah, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord of the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Agilon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there has been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Heavenly Father, we just pray right now in the name of Jesus that your word would impact us, Lord. That the anointing of your spirit would be upon our hearts to receive. That our minds might be open to receive. That our hearts might be anointed, once again, Lord, to receive the word of the Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, I repeat from earlier, and they, you know, as a speaker, they say it's 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 not a bad thing. In fact, they encourage you when you train as a speaker that that you repeat things because sometimes people miss it the first time because our minds are like, you know, wandering. Anybody have a wandering mind at the moment? No. Okay. Yeah. Because our minds are processing things so quickly and so many diverse. Things and a multitude of things that you miss things even when you're trying to focus. And even if you do catch it, sometimes it doesn't leave much of an impression, but you come back to it and sometimes it has more of an impression. So I want to say to you again this morning that our enemies don't always win. How many know that? Jesus won the battle on the cross for us. I went to the cross. The enemy was defeated. And then he went to the, to the grave and rose again on the third day in triumphant power. And you and I have the victory that's available to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And not just in eternity when we spend that with the Lord, but every moment of every day he's with us. But there are times... There are times that 
that it seems like, because of what's being allowed to happen, it seems like we're not winning. It seems like the enemy is winning. But in any warfare, in any battle, there are moments, strategic moments in time when things turn, when things can turn, when it looks like you're being defeated, when it looks like there's no hope, but then something happens, something pivotal happens, something that changes the whole situation happens, and now you're in victory and not in defeat. Amen? And so as we go through our lives, there are moments that we may feel overwhelmed. There are moments we, we can say, it just seems to me like I'm not winning here. It seems like the enemy's winning. I want to share with you this morning that God gives us victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. I want to share this with you before we get to the text. Romans 16, verse 20. This is for you. This is for somebody. All of us, maybe. Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet Shortly. Can I say that again? And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Moments come when the battle is turned. Moments come when it's revealed that we are more than conquerors to him that loved us. That we are overcomers. When we put it to the enemy. When the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So to the narrative. Let me give you the background. Quickly. As you know, God promised the land of Canaan to the Israelites. And they were beginning that process of taking over the land, of taking over Canaan. And Canaan didn't have just one group of people, they had all these various groups of people. Among them, for our purposes this morning, were the Residents of Gibeon, the Gibeonites. And there were others of the Canaanites and Hivites and para, paras, paras, not parasites, but <laughs> parasites. And for our purposes, Amorites and have the land and other ites. So, but we're going to look at the Gibeonites and the Amorites. There were all kinds of different factions in Canaan. And they were at war with each other often. And they were interested in occupying the most territory themselves. Each group. The inhabitants of Gibeon, which was a city and also surrounding little cities and areas, Realized that the Israelites were marching in the Canaan. And they realized that God and heaven was on their side. They realized that God had already began the process of giving them victory over the inhabitants of the land. They also knew that God had told the Israelites to wipe everybody out. Everybody's gone. Just everybody. Wipe them out. And so the Gibeonites had devised a clever plan to fool the Israelites to keep, keep themselves from being destroyed. And they tricked them. They put on old moth-eaten clothing and, and they had provisions with them that were kind of old and moldy and, and, you know, they looked and they were all dust-covered and they sent a group over to the camp of the Israelites looking like they had journeyed a long ways. 
And they said, we have journeyed a long ways, and we'd like to enter into a covenant with you. We'd like to enter into an agreement with you. So Joshua and the Israelites did that, not realizing that they were inhabitants of Canaan. But how many know that our word is good, right? And they had given their word. Now, when the Amorites learned that the inhabitants of Gibeon had done this to save their own hide, they said, we can't have this. We can't have this alliance between Gibeon and Israel. Because Gibeon was a, the capital of Gibeon was a very choice strategic location. We can't have that. And so before this can go any, any farther, they said, what we need to do is come and destroy the Gibeonites ourselves. And so the Amorites gathered a tremendously vast army. They said, we're just going to descend on the Gibeonites and destroy them. Before Joshua and the Israelites get here. So the men of Gibeon, they sent word. My special messenger, as fast as possible. Because they were quite some distance at Gilgal. They said, Lord, you know, the Amorites are coming against us. You need to come and help us because you agreed that we have an alliance and you would defend us and we would defend you. You've got to come and save us. So the word tells us that God speaks to Joshua and he says in verse 8, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hand. Not a man of them shall stand before you. I will give you total victory over the Amorites. And so Joshua and his men, they, they, they got things together and they hurried and they, and, and, and they traveled all night long. When the Amorites got to Gilgal, surprise, the Israelites are already here. Right? Surprise. Notice verse 10. So the Lord routed them before Israel. God destroyed the Amorites and gave Israel a great victory. He didn't have any regard for the Gibeonites, but he did for Israel, right? He said, they killed them with a great slaughter, Gibeon. And they chased them along the road. But they had not destroyed them completely. But notice this. God himself intervenes as the Amorites are fleeing because there's this vast, tremendously vast army. And the Israelites didn't want them to regroup so that they began to flee before them and they, they did begin to kill them but so many of them were getting away. God himself intervenes and begin to cast down large hailstones from heaven on the Amorites. Can you see it? Wow, a storm comes up, hailstones are coming. Not on the Israelites, but on the Amorites who are fleeing. God Himself. They died. In fact, verse 11 says there were more who died from the hailstones than the children of Israel killed with the sword. And then comes the part that's really. Amazed, uh, so beyond amazing. Joshua realizes even with that, even with God killing so many with hailstones and the Israelites killing so many with the sword, there were still so many left. And God had said, I'm going I'm to give them all into your hand. They're all going to be destroyed. Now you know Joshua has to be inspired by the Lord. How many know that God speaks through us and if we allow him, his spirit will even give us what we should say. Because we move in the flow of the spirit. 
And so let me explain you now who would do this. Who would do this if they, if they were not inspired by God, right? So Joshua speaks to the Lord. He says, you've got to give us more time. It's going to get dark and they're going to get away. So he sticks his neck out, says it's in front of all of Israel. This better, this better work out or he's going to look bad, right? But he, you know, sometimes we have to stick our neck. Sometimes we have to be bold. When we feel it from God, we have to be bold, right? Now never get ahead of the Lord. And never get outside of his spirit. Never do things on your own. That's what I believe. But when you feel the spirit moving, when you feel the words coming, when you feel impressed, as we say, to do things, be bold. Go with it. That's how it all works, isn't it? And so he was. He didn't hesitate. In the sight of all Israel, he, as God inspires him, he calls out and says, and this is what he says, he speaks to the Son. Who does that? I must confess, in all the time I've been on the earth, I have never spoken to the sun. I've never spoken to the moon. I've spoken to myself many times. And that's an issue of all its own. But he speaks to the sun. He says, son, stand still over Gibeon. Don't go down completely into sunset. And then he says to the moon, as you know, which rotates around the earth. He said, I want you to stay in the valley of Agilon, where you are now. Just stay. Wow, this better work out. That's a big statement, right? But notice what the word of the Lord says. So the sun stood still, stopped. And the moon stopped. Till the people had revenge upon their enemies. It might be one writer declared that I read that it might be that it didn't totally stop because it did have to eventually go down. It wouldn't suddenly go down in an instant, so it might have slowed down so much that it took an extra day for it to set. Amen? Amazing. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? Jasher is not a book in the Bible, by the way. It's believed perhaps to have been a book about battles and warfare and how God gave victory to the Israelites. And it seems to indicate that this particular battle and what God did was contained in that book of songs and prose and poems. So the sun, in verse 13, stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there has been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man like that. For the Lord fought for Israel. For the Lord fought for Israel. I want you to know today that God fights for you. The Lord fights for you. When the Israelites were crossing the Red Sea, and the Egyptians were right behind them. In Exodus 14, verse 13, this is what Moses says to the people. Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall not see again no more forever. See the salvation of the Lord, right? 
Why? Because he fights for you. Exodus 14 and 14 says, The Lord, which is that same story, The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. The Lord will fight for you. Oh, that's the message for you today. The Lord will fight for you. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There are moments of sweet victory. You've all experienced them. The battle has been raging, the enemy's been beating you and beating you and coming against you. And often, as I said before, and I repeat myself, we feel like I'm not winning. I don't, feel, I don't feel like I'm winning. I mean, it can be overwhelming sometimes. But in those moments, be encouraged by this truth. Don't just focus on what you're experiencing, what seems like you're not winning at that moment. Focus on this truth. There's a payday coming. My enemies are going to have to pay. Because God fights for me. And there will be revenge. And there will be victory. And I will overcome. Amen? I will overcome. I will overcome. Because I'm more than a conqueror through him that loves me. And it might not be today. I hope it is. And it might not be tomorrow. But devil, you're going to pay. You are going to pay. You're going to pay in a lot of ways. Number one, you're going to pay because I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be stronger. I'm not going to be defeated by this. I'm not going to be overwhelmed by this. I'm not going to be conquered by this. I'm going to come back at you stronger and stronger and stronger. You're messing with the wrong person. Not because of me, because God is with me. Because God fights for me. And I will be stronger. And God is going to give me victory over you. Not only this moment, not, not only concerning this particular thing that I'm dealing with, but in the future. God is going to make you pay. You're going to pay. Because there's going to be victory in my life. And people are going to be impacted by my life. And people are going to be delivered because of how God is working in my life. Because the more you come at me, the more I believe in God and his power. The more you come at me, the more God is going to fight for me. Do you believe it this morning? Our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with me. Power and love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, love, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, love. Our God is an awesome God. Yes, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, love. Our God is an awesome God. Will you stand your feet with me? Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an 
an awesome God he reigned from heaven above with wings. The power of love our God is an awesome God. It's our God. Sure. 